Good evening and welcome everybody to tonight's program, uh, Reflections on Modern Art Histories in and Across Africa, South and Southeast Asia. I'm John Tain, Head of Research here at Asia Art Archive. And if you are joining us tonight, then you are no doubt aware that Modern Art Histories, or MAHASA, is a program that we uh, co-organized, was co-organized by the Institute for Comparative Modernities at Cornell University, the Dhaka Art Summit, and Asia Art Archive, and supported by the Connecting Art Histories Initiative at the Getty Foundation. It gather, gathered together 21 younger scholars from four continents with a group of renowned faculty to learn and share and think through the histories of and intersections between the three regions in two intensive 10-day sessions, first here in Hong Kong in August of 2019, and then in Dhaka this past February in the midst of the most recent edition of the Dhaka Art Summit. Since this past summer, with our colleagues at Asia Art Archive in America and at the Institute for Comparative Modernities at uh, Cornell, we have organized a number of online panels to share with our publics some of the thinking and knowledge, the dialogues and discussions that was such a vital part of the intellectual dynamism that is Mahasa. And I think I speak for the faculty and organizers in saying that the younger participants taught us at least as much as they may have learned from us. With that in mind tonight, we have asked four of them to briefly present their research and to be followed by a moderated conversation and concluding with questions from the audience. Allow me to introduce our, our panelists in order of presentation. Marianne Nergroni is a historian whose work revolves particularly around collections histories in and from East Africa, often examined through a diasporic focus, raising questions about the writing of history and the processes of heritage making. Marianne currently conducts research on the collection of Joseph Marumbi in Nairobi in the frame of Pan-African debates around material culture, museum and restitution issues from the 1950s to the 1970s. She holds a PhD in history, art history from the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. Carlos Quijon Jr. is an art historian, curator, and critic. His criticism and writings have appeared in Art Forum, MoMA's Post, Asia Art Archive's Ideas Journal, and Trans-Asia Phot Photography Review, among others. In 2017, he was a research resident at the MMCA Seoul and a fellow of the Transcult Curatorial Academy, both in Berlin and Mumbai. He curated Courses of Action in Hong Kong in 2019, A Will for Prolific Disclosures in Manila 2020, and co-curated Minor Infelicities in Seoul, also 2020. He is completing an MA in Art Theory and Criticism at the University of the Philippines. Dipti Sherchan is a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She explores the intersections of ethnography and art history to critically examine cultural politics, histories, and counters in South Asia. In particular, she looks at the cultural politics of institutions such as art schools, museums, and galleries in Nepal as spaces of knowledge and counter-knowledge about the nation uh, um, uh, as, act as they are actively produced and reproduced. Tashif Kara is a research fellow at the Center of Islamic Studies at the University of Cambridge. His doctoral research focuses on the intellectual history and migration of the diasporic Koja community in South Asia and East Africa. He is also interested in the relationship of ideas to aesthetics in the post-colonial world, especially architecture. He has lectured on Muslim political thought at SOAS and is currently a, co a producer at Interventions, an intellectual history podcast. And Sanjukta Sundrasan, who is a faculty member for Mahasa and who has graciously agreed to moderate tonight's conversation after just landing in India, is assistant, is assistant professor at University of Leiden. Beginning next February, she will be senior assistant professor in the history of art at the University of Amsterdam. Her research expands on her interests in the aesthetics of decolonization by looking at post-partition visual art across India, West and East Pakistan during the 1950s, 60s, and alongside simultaneous transnational formations of third world cultural solidarities. Her book, Partisan Aesthetics, Modern Art and India's Long Decolonization was published in 2020 by Stanford University Press. And two quick words before I hand things over. First, if you are joining us on Zoom, please type any questions you may have via the Q&A function at any point in time, no need to wait. And last but not least, I want to give just a quick shout out to everyone who made tonight's program possible. Garfield Chow, Helena Halim, Susanna Chung, and Sam Kwok here at AAA, as well as the many, many people involved in Mahasa 
especially the participants and faculty and co-hosts uh, with the most, uh, Iftikhar Dadi and Diana Campbell. You all are magic and I can't wait to see you all again. And without further ado, I will hand things over to Marianne. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for this invitation. It's great to be back in the Mahasa galaxy. Um, my name is Marian. I am an historian and I work on the Joseph Mumbi collection, which is today conserved at the National Archives of Kenya in Nairobi. I will share my screen. So in this presentation, within five minutes, I would like to especially make two points about the challenges of this research. Point number one is to briefly explain the title of my presentation, the Murumbi Collection as an ouvroir of potential art histories or of potential histories. And my point number two is to highlight a kind of turning point in my research that was somehow triggered by a session of Mahasa in Hong Kong uh, that still guides my questionings uh, in my research. But first, who is um, Murumbi, Joseph Murumbi? Uh, he was born in 1911, he died in 1990, so he almost crossed the century, and also several uh, geopolit geopolitical spaces, Africa, Asia, in particular India and Europe. He was of Maasai and of Indian descent by his father, came from Goa to East Africa in 1897. Before holding official position very briefly in Kenya before uh, from 1963 to 1966, his dedicated work within transnational liberation networks was instrumental in the years leading up to Kenya independence in 1963. From the 50s on, uh, Murumbi also became a collector of African art and a patron of artists, and he collected artifacts from all over Africa, advocating for the preservation of, of African heritage and art on site. But over time, my understanding of the collection has shifted. At the beginning, uh, my attention was focused mainly uh, on the art and ethnographic collection alone. I slowly came to realize that I should perhaps uh, conceive the co this collection along with his, his archive, the thousands of documents that he collected himself uh, and he produced uh, during his militant and political uh, activity or career. Just a few examples of the many diverse documents that you can find in this archive. Um, but also along the book library that he also put together. Indeed, when Murumbi sold this collection to the Kenya, Kenya government in 1976, his hope was that the, the art collection would become the core of a Pan-African Centers of African Studies in Nairobi, uh, so that students and researchers would no longer have to expatriate themselves to Europe to get access to the archives or sources to write their own history. Unfortunately, the project never came to be. Still, it remains very powerful um, to me, including for today's aspirations and needs. Uh, and from the point of view of my research, it also acts as a kind of device to think through uh, his collection. This means trying to understand the collection in a broader sense, hence the idea of exploring the multiple entanglements between artworks, artifacts, objects, I mean, documents and books. And this is where I come back to the title of my presentation, the collection, this collection, as an ouvroir of potential histories, a quote from a very tiny book, but yet wonderful book by um, philosopher and art historian Georges Didier Berman, where ouvroir means uh, a tool that helps uh, opening something else. And this brings me to my second and last point, Hong Kong and the making of this research. 
One evening, uh, during the program, we attended a fabulous panel uh, entitled Curating Place, a conversation across complex uh, geographies, so where uh, we have these wonderful panelists that you see on the top of the slide. And it might seem a little bit silly, but this idea of complex geographies suddenly operated like a kind of illumination uh, and which had some rippling effects in my research that I not all resolved, <laughs> I think. Uh, and I did, I find it beautiful that the world collection of Joseph Murumbi is today conserved at the National Archives, um, the Kenyan National Archives in Nairobi, an institution that Murumbi himself pushed uh, to set up in 1966. And as he said, it's time that we as independent countries protect through legislation what belongs to us and what should remain in this country. And of course, so, how to think, or should I say, how to open the study of a collection which Murumi himself conceived as a Pan-African one, so a, trans a transnational one, was ethnographic objects are today mainly exhibited along ethnic lines within a national space, the National Archives of Kenya, was building first house the Bank of India, a national space that sits next to a couple of streets just behind uh, called uh, Accra, Accra Street or W.E.B. Du Bois Street, of course, of Pan-African memory. So uh, to end, how to think together all these different levels without flattening them, and also how to live up to Murumbi's powerful uh, political imagination which joined the dots between knowledge production through the arts and through scholarly methods. Thank you. And I hand it over to Carlos now. Thank you. Hi everyone and thank you Marian. Um, good day and good, good evening from Mandela. Um, before I start, I would like to thank John and the Asia Art Archive uh, team for organizing this panel. I would also like to thank the Mahasa faculty and cohorts for the productive engagement with the earlier stages of this research, um, bulk of which is part of an ongoing research interest on the exhibition histories of the region in the 1990s. Um, again, I'm Carlos Cohen Jr. I'm a graduate student and curator who works and lives in Manila. Um, my research for Mahasa addresses the problematic of modernism in Southeast Asia in the 1990s. In considering the trajectory of modernism in this period, it would be fundamental to recognize its belated articulation, not only in relation to its Western sources, but more so in the history of modernism in the region. My argument is that in the 1990s, the art history of modernism in the region is already quite articulate and cognizant of its relationship with Western modernism. And by looking at this particular moment in this history, we might glean how efforts in the region have been key in reimagining the terms of modernity and modernism, um, what might thinking about modernism outside the West consist of, and in the research that I do, how can an imagination of modernism be informed by discourses of regionality and be able to generate understandings of modern art that is shaped by interventive compelling and com competent agencies from the region itself. Um, this is part of the effort to emphasize its geopolitical context in as much as to foreground what the art historian and curator Patrick D. Flores nominates as the geopoetic capacity of the region and its interlocutors and modes of interlocution. For me, this should be a vital mindset in any efforts to think transnationally or to involve to invoke how histories and ideas travel in and across regions, uh, which the Mahasa platform is all about. Um, a timeline can help us visualize this milieu. Um, my research looks at the three exhibitions um, there in blue at the tail end of this timeline. <clears throat> One is Asian Modernism, Diverse Developments in Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines, presented in 1995 and traveled to Bangkok, Jakarta, and Manila in 1996. It was originally presented in Tokyo. Um, the other two are Modernity and Beyond in 1996, which was the inaugural exhibition of the Singapore Art Museum. And in 1997, the exhibition, The Birth of Modern Art in Southeast Asia. So that's um, the one 
on the right that traveled in across Japan. Um, just to help us imagine, these are some of the artworks in the Philippine section of the exhibition Asian Modernism in its iteration in Tokyo. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, and then next slide. Okay, in this timeline are other platforms that mark a contemporary turn in Asian and uh, slash Southeast Asian art. For example, the exhibition New Art from Southeast Asia in 1992 and the landmark symposium on contemporary art titled The Potential of Asian Thought in 1994. In identifying three exhibitions in the 1990s that look at modernism in the region and nominating them as articulations of belatedness, just as my title um, says, it is important to emphasize that this is not only a belatedness in relation to a Western history, but also to the history of modernism in the region. We can take our cue from Fukuoka Art Museum curator Masahiro Ushiro Shoji, who writing for the exhibition The Birth of Modern Art in Southeast Asia, um, accounts for the discrete local developments of modernism in the region, as you see in the slide. We can say um, that these moments are canonical ones um, in the development of modernism in the region, in which we may discern an understanding of modernist sensibility as we know it resistance to classicism and recognition of the power of art to speak to a more contemporary context, emergence of institutions and infrastructures that cultivate structures of modern aesthetic education, and uh, in general, entanglement and colonial structures of artistic education, to name a few. It is not in the sense that modernism arrives late in the region or in Southeast Asia, or that Southeast Asia discovers modernism late but that there are new contexts to which these articulations respond or engage with the modernity of the region or regional identity, and in particular for Asian modernism, the traveling exhibition form. In my research, these two contexts are rendered more compelling during this period. For example, by way of exhibitions, symposia, conventions, writings, um, the modernity of the regional formation itself and the identifications it fleshes out is facilitated by the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is the ASEAN. One can mention the exhibition, the ASEAN Mobile Exhibition, or uh, the first itinerant ASEAN exhibition of fine art and photography in 1973-1974, um, which showcased works by artists from the region and traveled to Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore and Thailand. Both the modernity of the region and the exhibition form informed the history of exhibitions of modernism in the region in the 1990s. The ASEAN Workshop Exhibition and Symposium on Aesthetics, ASEAN WESA for short, is important in understanding the complexity of this history. Held in Kuala Lumpur in 1989, Manila in 1993, and Singapore in 1995, the exhibition gathered artists and interlocutors from the region. The traveling aspect is important in the recognition of the region's, dis region's dispersed and extensive composition. Unlike the mobile exhibition in 1973-1974, which were helmed by diplomats and that gathered existing works that were deemed representative of art in Southeast Asia, the ASEAN West uh, were helmed by art historians, critics, and artists. It also became a site of discussion and pedagogy with its workshop and symposium components, which sharpened the competent agencies of interlocutors from the region who gathered, met, and conversed, and imagined a sense of region. In looking at the exhibitions on modernism in the 1990s, it is important to trace this line, particularly when we talk about how consolidated and articulated concerns of regionality already are during the period in the 1990s. Curators and annotators of the exhibitions in 1990s took part in the ASEAN WESA. <clears throat> Alice Guillermo, who co-curated the exhibition Asian Modernism, uh, was a delegate to the first and second WESA. TK Sabapathy, who curated Modernity and Beyond in 1996, uh, took part in all three WESAs. And 
another thinker and uh, art historian, Ron Perez Perez, who wrote for the 1997 exhibition, The Birth of Modern Art in Southeast Asia, was present in the third WESA. Concerns from the WESA also recur in these exhibitions. The modernity of tradition and the way idioms that are not readily considered as modern in the Western sense acquire a sense of modernity in the context of region. In this framework, we can glean the compelling co coordinates of the regional and the exhibitionary in reconsidering the trajectory of modernism that problematizes its Western conceptualization and perhaps complicates it by situating it in new relations of coloniality or in Apinan Poshananda's terms within the relations of a post-hegemonic world. Here in particular, the infrastructures that were developed by Japan. However, ending the analysis as a matter of overdeterminations of coloniality would prove insufficient and simplistic in this context. As the compelling research and historization of agents in the milieu and from the region will show, while various formations, ASEAN, Japan, Asia Center, etc., had their own diplomatic and political agenda in terms of how they developed infrastructures, agents were not nearly instrumentalized by the inf infrastructures that they found themselves enabled within or by. They were intelligent and articulate without also being too naive about their subjective exceptionality vis-a-vis -vis these colonial or geopolitical, geopolitical largesse. Dispensations of regionality, because they situate modernity and modernism in prolific contexts and sites, point us to more sympathetic urgencies with which to reconsider the art history of modernism. Keen on refusing both the complete foreclosure of a local geopoetic agency and intelligence, nor the total disavowal of neo slash neocolonial entanglements and how they substantially alter the Southeast Asian life world. Thank you. So I turn you over to the next speaker, another Maso colleague, uh, Deputy Shark Chan. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Dipti Sergeon and I'm a PhD student um, in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Illinois Chicago, like John mentioned. Uh, I'm very happy to be here at the early hours and to engage in this productive and generative discussion. Um, so I have been looking at state-sponsored art institutions in the context of a newly federated Republic of Nepal as a central site of political contestations over renewed visions of a decentralized and democratic nation state. And I've sort of been intrigued by the idea of what it means for something to be state-sponsored uh, when uh, a nation state is fractured along uh, a lot of political lines and has undergone numerous shifts in political regimes and state power. Um, in the context of Nepal, there was a decade long civil war from 1996 to 2006 between the Maoist insurgents and the incumbent government. Um, then under the ceremonial monarchy. Um, and then Nepal entered almost another decade of political impasse without a consensus on how the Nepali state was going to be federalized and decentralized. On May 28, 2008, Nepal was declared a federal republic state following a decade-long civil war between them. As the absolute Hindu monarch was ousted, the newly envisioned post-conflict democracy in Nepal required a massive federal structuring and restructuring of state power. So what does it even mean for an art for any cultural project to be state-sponsored has been sort of a persistent question in my dissertation project. For today's presentation, I wanted to share five images that have become central entry points to my research inquiry. These are images that I've, I've also shared during the Mahasa presentations and, and I've been thinking about it a lot um, since Mahasa happened. Um, and so I would just wanted to share these images with you. Um, the first image, um, as you can read in the caption is uh, from uh, Nepal's first art school called Juddha Art school, Dutakala Art School, uh, which is considered um, 
which was established by an aristocratic Rana ruler, Duddha Samsar, in early 1940s. And the school currently operates as a government college for fine arts education uh, as a different name, Lalit Kala Campus. And this is a group photo dated 1959 of uh, one of the earliest cohorts of teachers and students at the school. Um, and it includes some uh, notable names in the Nepali art scene and also like aspiring young art students and the way i've been thinking about this image is this image haunts me as a researcher and this haunting of this sort of image reflects on this haunting of or a desire for a to recuperate a nepali art history and this is something that as a as an ethnographer is interest is an interesting struggle because um I am not an art historian, but I've had to sort of think about art history through an ethnographic lens. Um, and so I have sort of been grappling with this issue. Uh, one of the central uh, issues with this particular image and this particular history is the, his the sort of incommensurate history of Nepal sort of supposedly never having been colonized. And this is what something that was discussed throughout the Mahasa uh, seminar and workshops. And I've been thinking a lot more about incommensurability when it comes to how art histories are thought of and how art histories are shared or connected or at times disconnected. So this is one of the images that are sort of central to my research inquiry. Um, so the second image here is, um, is a publication uh, cover page. Um, let me just, yeah. So um, this book is written by Naren Bahadur Singh, who is known as Nepal's pioneering art critique writer, who published reviews of artworks and events in the National Daily called Golkha Patra. While he was also employed at the former Royal Nepal Academy, he authored a volume entitled History of Contemporary Nepali Painting Art in 1976, which sort of provides a survey of Nepali artists and styles since 19th century. Uh, this is not the cover for that book, but, the, but this is another publication by him, which is a collection of essays titled Art and Experience a Contemplation. So the thing about this particular image and this particular writer is there's usually a rhetoric of there is no Nepali art history because no one has written about it, but no one has gone about to sort of look uh, systematically look at the archives and think about Re recovering some of these institutionally published um, uh, volumes that do attempt to present a sort of a survey or a narrative about what Nepali art is or was um, historically. And to me, what is interesting about um, uh, this institutional history approach to publications is the fact that they, how do they fit into the political project of cultural nationalism? What kind of Nepali art are they writing about? What kind of Nepali artists are they writing about? And, and so this is another question is how do these publications become part of a state project of legibility? Um, the second sort of absence in these kind of writings is also absence of writings by women or indigenous uh, people or people that belong to marginalized groups. So usually institutional history becomes a history of elite uh, members. And so I've been sort of grappling with the second set of um, questions about who is writing an institutional history when and, and, uh, and what is the stake uh, in writing such a history and even working with such a history, right? The third image here is um, from uh, a magazine uh, w from 1970. It is called NAFA um, Art Magazine, which is one of the earliest publication uh, under published under the aegis of Nepal Association of Fine Arts, which was a formal association established in 1965 under the patronage of former King Bir Bikram Sahadev for the development and promotion of Nepali art and artists. Uh, what is interesting about NAFA as an organization is since its establishment, it has undergone quite a bit of transformation, uh, including its name, which it no longer goes by Nepal Association of Fine Arts. Uh, it now goes as Nepal Academy of Fine Arts. And there is a whole 
history of this organization and how it has evolved um, that is very crucial in understanding um, the Nepali art world and its um, culture of politics, which is another sort of thing that I'm interested in doing in my research. Um, and something that I've also sort of learned while um, my sort of um, during the Mahasa presentations and workshops and discussions as well, this idea of magazines as a source of recuperating and contextualizing the broader political history um, or cultural history of a nation state. And so I've been sort of looking at some of these magazines and trying to understand what role it played in sort of formalizing or making visible the Nepali art scene. So shifting gears, while I look at archives, I also look at ethno I also have an ethnographic approach to understanding Nepali art scene. And so in the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to meet with Nepali artists and talk to them about their art works and their sort of life history, which again allows me to read uh, against the grain of the archives that I'm working with as well. So for example, in this case, uh, this is Sarada Chitrakar, who is one of the senior Nepali artists and also a researcher. She is the daughter of Tej Bahadu Chitrakar, who, if you look at this image here, at the center, um, there is a person in the garland who, who is who, who, who is his, her father, who was the first principal of the art school. But the funny thing about her is she never formally learned art and she, she considers herself to be self-taught. And one of the interesting things during our conversations was she has a lot of, she works with the medium of watercolor. And I sort of was asking her, why was she working? Um, why did she choose the medium of watercolor? And for her, the medium was the most affordable medium, the most portable medium, the most easy to use medium while she was, um, you know, getting married, having children. And so there is this idea of um, the medium being flexible to her conditions that somehow does not really come across archives. If you look at writings, some, this is a narrative that doesn't really come across often. And then she also served as the vice chancellor in the Nepal Academy of Fine Arts, which I briefly discussed earlier, which is again something that becomes obscure and doesn't really get mentioned or highlighted. So my sort of ethnographic approach has been sort of, I guess, sprinkled with these desire to recuperate and um, sort of bring back these narratives. The final slide is of uh, another artist that I've been meeting and um, from the early days of my research. Her name is Urmila Upadhyay Gurg, and she has an interesting history, again, which is never really found in formal archives, but something that when you go and meet her, she's very happy to sit down with you and talk to you about uh, what she's gone through. At an early age of eight, she was sent to study at the Gandhian Shivagram Ashram in Warda, India. She also later on, because uh, her love for art was cultivated in this um, ashram, she joined the JJ School of Art in, uh, for her fine arts diploma in Bombay. In early 60s, she attended uh, um, the art school in Paris, and then she comes back to Nepal, uh, and then in 1983 establishes Kalaguti, which is a creative arts trust in Kathmandu with the aspiration of starting the first textile institution in Nepal. So, so sort of a, a full circle moment, entering into this research, trying to understand state-sponsored art institutions and arriving at an institution, which is an art institution that is led um, and built and cultivated by by Urmila Upadhyay Garg has been sort of an interesting journey for me as a researcher to understand what happens when certain figures, certain members in the community um, have to struggle for space, have to struggle for recognition, and how do alternative institutions arrive out of that political struggle. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening to me. Oh, and I'll hand it back to I'll hand it over to Toshi. Sorry. <laughs>
Um, thank you so much, Titi, um, and thank you everyone for the fantastic presentations. Um, and thank you to John and everyone at AAA for inviting me. Um, Mahasa was a truly kind of <clears throat> really illuminating experience for me because I, I, you know, like some of the other participants, I don't come from an art history background, um, and I'm interested in the history of ideas. And so, just the kind of conversations that we had um, really pushed me to think beyond my own kind of disciplinary training and, and think across um, across regions, but also across kind of um, disciplinary formations, which is you know something that. The, the modern academy doesn't really uh, push you to do. So um, I, uh, I'm going to sort of be quite brief uh, in my in my comments um, and just really kind of present a little bit of my research um, and then present a kind of um, moment or instance that haunted me, kind of like uh, the dimension, a kind of uh, incommensurability that I was struggling with in my own um, context. So I work on, um, I'm just going to share my screen now. I work on um, the Koja community and the Koja are a trading, uh, trading community originally from Western India, uh, who kind of by the late 19th century had a well-established presence around the Indian Ocean world. Um, but as the sort of 20th century progresses, they are conceptually sort of named as a minority um, regardless of the vantage point. So in India, they are Muslim subjects. In Africa, they are Indian subjects. And um, in the kind of Muslim world, they are Shia subjects. Um, and some of the things that I've, I've been trying to think about is, first of all, how do they escape or refuse this category of the minority? Um, but how might we read uh, through that kind of microcosm, broader tensions um, across the kind of a history of modernism around the Indian Ocean between the kind of particular and the universal. And this kind of, in a way, comes full circle back to Marianne's presentation about um, this tension between the kind of particularity of nation or the kind of particularity of um, an ethnic group or a tribal group and this kind of vast expanse of Pan-Africanism. So in this context, I'm looking sort of towards the Indian Ocean and trying to kind of theorize out of the Indian Ocean um, some of, of, of these questions. Um, so one way, uh, one of the primary ways in which they escape or refuse this minority category um, is through the kind of architectural endeavors they embark upon. Um, so the construction of several Jamaat Khana spaces, and the Jamaat Khana space is a kind of community prayer space um, around East Africa in the moments leading up to decolonization, um, take on a, a sort of really deliberately modernist character. Um, they feature, you know, perforated screens. They're all single floors, which is a bit of a rupture from previous iterations, um, which would have multiple floors, higher floors reserved for sort of meditation and dhikr or Sufi sort of me uh, meditative practice are now kind of, everything is sort of collapsed into one floor, um, gesturing towards a kind of spiritual and material egalitarianism. In this Jamaat kind of space, for instance, you have um, a kind of, quite whimsical sort of abstraction of a minaret um, in the sort of shadow of a mountain there. But for the Khojas um, who don't practice any kind of uh, sort of conventional Sunni prayer, they have no need for the adhan or the call to prayer. So the minaret is truly a kind of, um, it, it, it's kind of void of function here entirely. Um, other spaces include this, um, you know, Jamaat Khana in, in Nairobi, um, which again is a single force space and, and, and they commissioned a sort of Swiss architect to design this. So this is sort of the, the, the majority of my research looks at this modernist character and how um, it allows for a kind of abstraction of the community, uh, which especially in the 1950s and 60s is increasingly named as a racial minority in Kenya. Uh, and other parts of East Africa. Um, and modernism, as we all know, because of its kind of universalist claims, its cosmopolitan claims, its ability to uh, you know, allegedly reject the kind of shibboleth of a reified culture, provides this, this minority group a, a form of escape and a form of refusal. Um, but one thing that kind of Mahasa pushed me to think further about um, had to do with this particular image that continuously haunts me um, and then sort of frustrates me um, in different ways. And that's because 
it was a very, it was a sort of institution that was constructed by the Khojas, but also by other minority groups in East Africa, the Borjas, namely. Um, and of course, it looks nothing like any of the previous um, buildings. Um, and it was constructed around the same time. And it was, there was quite a bit of money that was um, put into this building. It was a vocational college um, meant to train um, coastal Muslims in the kind of arts and sciences of the Indian Ocean world. So what I mean by that is they had courses in navigation, in engineering, in craftsmanship, meant to kind of design uh, or think through the Tao as a kind of form. Um, and they also had courses in Islam and language and that kind of thing. Um, and it was built around 1955. And, and, and I was just kind of thinking, well, well, why? Why this aesthetic choice? You know, what, what is, what does this mean? Um, and especially, you know, this looks a lot like what we call today kind of Swahili, classic Swahili architecture. It references Zanzibar, it references the kind of teak doors, brass studs that are sort of brought from around the Indian Ocean world into East Africa. Um, and how to square this with the refusal and escape that I saw in the other, um, other buildings. Um, and what I've kind of come to is that, you know, the vastness and expansive universalist claims that modernism offered and that the Khojas kind of earnestly turned towards mirrors, in a sense, the kind of universalism of, the, of Islam in the Indian Ocean world, right? Um, there's a kind of parallel um, that's going on here. And um, that's not simply because um, it's a kind of vast and expansive space. It's also because uh, the Indian Ocean, similarly to modernism, allows the minority as a political and conceptual category to dissolve, right? Um, it makes a demographic majority impossible, first of all, um, but also the sheer scale and, and the sheer nature of the diversity across the Indian Ocean world um, makes everyone into a minority. And so it allows the kind of particularity of region to not get sort of swallowed up, but just really diffused. Um, and so really what's going on here, and, 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 I, and I mean, this is something that I've kind of come to at the end of my research, is, is a sort of double act of refusal. On the one hand, an escape into, uh, you know, the abstraction of modernism, but on the other hand, an escape into the abstraction of Islam and the Indian Ocean, right? Um, and, and something that I'm trying to think towards is, well, there is, of course, a sort of spectral majority in the Indian Ocean, and that is Islam, right? If there is a majoritarian tendency around the Indian Ocean, it is the unifying character of Islam. But even then, within that kind of majoritarian tendency, by locating Islam away from, say, the Arab world or the Middle East and locating it in the Indian Ocean, again, you have this diffusion, um, and the Indian Ocean opens up kind of, um, and, and this kind of, I really like Marian's concept of the sort of ouvrir, the opening, right? Indian Ocean op offers this opening where internal diversity and the variety of difference can kind of operate um, alongside uh, an idea of unity, right? And I think something that Mahasa was really, I mean, one of the main tensions for me running through Mahasa, um, and I think running through people who work on, on this period more broadly, is this kind of tension between these arcane forms of connection um, and cosmopolitanism and their fragmentation in the moments of decolonization, right? But how to think through these, uh, this tension productively is something that I've been struggling with and thinking through the minority and how the minority kind of escapes and dissol dissolves um, is, is one way in which I, I try to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna just conclude here then because I think uh, I really like to hear from, from everyone else and kind of go into the discussion. So thank you all. And I'll pass it over to uh, Shunzukta. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, it's such a delight to see all of you, all of us rather, again, uh, considering we met in Dhaka in February before, at least in Europe, lockdown started in March. So um, I feel it's, I think we deserve ending the year uh, like this at some level, though all of us are spread out and I don't know, four or five time zones, or I don't know how many time zones are being. Um, Thank you so much. Um, I can see connections between what, uh, right, you, you all presented during uh, Mahasa, but I also see uh, trans 
formations uh, of certain questions, but maybe streamlining of some other questions, some new slides, uh, considering I remember all the slides, it seems. So that's also a nice thing. So I was thinking how to begin, right? And we were talking about this when we were gathering uh, today, what should be our entry point? And of course, Mahasa frames this conversation. And for me personally, one of the biggest things that I saw in the Mahasa cohort in the participants uh, was that we had people who were here at, uh, you know, uh, connecting arts, art, arts histories kind of conversation and people who were coming from uh, multiple uh, disciplines. And so in a way, uh, that was an interesting point for me to also learn from that the struggles one has in terms of working out methodologies of looking at art is something that is A, faced by many other people, but also researchers who are working now are actually looking at art from interdisciplinary questions while keeping a focus on the question of aesthetic form, right? Or thinking about uh, not just, uh, so, so, so while, the, while the focus remains. So I thought maybe, maybe archive then could be one way of moving ahead because of course this is something many people are talking about, but uh, I want to also open up the question of the archive and thinking about our different interdisciplinary, not interdisciplinary ways of reading the archives, but interdisciplinary struggles around the archive. And if we keep art at a focal point, right? So we still think of form, we think, still think of questions that art history wants us to think, but we just come from different, um, uh, different places, uh, literally, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of what the particular contextual questions we carry right, historical, locational questions, but also disciplinary places. Uh, so, yeah, so I think that could be something we could begin with. And uh, just listening to you, I have all these papers. Uh, I try to be very organized with all these different uh, papers, but you know, there I, I was thinking what struck me in all the presentations, and I'll just mention that and op open up some of the questions is that there are ways in which in your presentations today, the question of the archive enters the question of time, I think. And I'm thinking Carlos's work here, uh, the question of place, literally and otherwise, Marion's uh, presentation. I found Deepthi's point around the fragment and the haunting of the fragment fascinating. Um, haunting, of course, something Kashif you brought out again. But vis-a-vis um, -vis Deepthi's, and again, it's not specifically to one person, but what triggered my uh, thoughts. So the question of the fragment, the frame and flexibility of the frame. And I, so your artist at the end, Deepthi, talking about how this was, the, the, the medium was a flexible one. So it allowed certain kinds of artistic subjectivity to develop. So maybe the questions have to be flexible. Huh? So, and then uh, closing with Toshib's point about yeah, uh, I think fragment came up, haunting came up, but escape and refusal. So an archives of escape and archives of refusal. Uh, and I personally often uh, struggle with archives of absence for that matter. Uh, so, so these are some of the broader kind of, uh, let's say nodes within, which could, I guess, mark our conversation. So I'll just raise some questions and any of you just feel free to um, just start speaking basically. Um, I, I, to, to Carlos, I'm thinking, do you think, ref reflecting on Patrick Flores's point about the geopoetics, right? Is there a way in which we could bring in the question of um, time mm -hmm. in the sense that is there a historiographical time? Uh, we mm -hmm. think of genealogy, we think of the time of modernity and we critique the time of modernity and we talk about heterogeneous times of the nation and mm -hmm. so, so forth. Is there a time of historiography? and how that can, uh, yeah, historiography is one way of putting it, but also the time of thought, the time of thinking around mm -hmm. that, huh? and whether that then leads us to certain ways of capturing genealogies of ideas. And we had these conversations in Dhaka, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, especially with mm -hmm. Simon's points about the word modern in different languages and so on. So is that something you are intrigued by? Um, because we talk about, also connected to this, um, another question I had for you was that we are talking about ASEAN as a region and the presence of regional consciousness. I am also thinking, so in these conversations, in these exhibitions, do you see any uh, discussion about identities of region or conceptualization of region beyond ASEAN? And I personally yeah. do not have 
problem with the geopolitics of ASEAN. That's fine. We know that mm -hmm. it's a commission. But when these gatherings happen, ASEAN doesn't control the conversation, right? So in the conversation, yeah. are there other visions of region coming up? And this relates to this point about the time of historiography, the time of thought, the time of genealogy. Um, do you think, is there something there? Mm -hmm. I think, um, well, responding to your points, I think um, what uh, struck me about your points is the idea of archival struggles and how, in terms of my thinking, uh, I'm always interested in recoding or transcoding the idea of struggles into sympathies and how if you reframe questions of struggles into questions of sympathies, um, what are the moments of generativity in that sense? Um, for example, there's the sympathy like for Dipti, the idea of um, watercolor as a form, as a modern mm -hmm. form. So yeah. all these questions are opened up when we reframe um, our approaches to ideas at region. And um, yeah, I think that the, the discourses of refusal, refusal and also negotiation will be more complex if we transcode our ideas of struggles or even critique in the, in the most um, general sense into um, finding out points of um, moments of uh, what Michelle, Michelle Wong uh, mentioned about parallel urgencies. Um, and for me, it's about um, points of sympathy, sympathetic, um, looking for sympathetic um, urgencies. Um, in terms of the idea of region, definitely um, ASEAN is just one moment or one citation of region um, that flourished in the history of Southeast Asia. Um, and I think um, most, if not all, of the thinkers in the period, like Alice Guillermo, um, TK Sabapati, they all acknowledge that there are other ways of thinking about the region. And I think um, in, in my practice, I'm also interested in that idea of, for example, uh, Spivak mentions, um, talks about the idea of altered citations. And uh, I think that is also an interesting point of departure in thinking about region. How, how is it imagined, reimagined, um, et cetera. Um, the work of uh, another Mahasa cohort um, Kathleen Ditzig work, um, looks at this yeah. and um, um, in, um, in relation to Mahasa actually we're developing um, this idea of altered citations and extending it to the idea of Mafilindo for example another um, a formation or idea of regionality um, that revolves around um, Southeast Asia for example in Mafilindo it's a um, pan-Malayan ethnos that um, uh, um, so the, the Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines um, started this confederation in the 1960s. And the idea was to um, reframe questions of region in relation to a pan Malayan ethnos. Mm -hmm. And connecting that to yeah, your question about iterations of region, definitely there are. And, in each iteration of region, we will, we can um, point out um, friction and also aspirations why these uh, um, citations exist. Yeah. So in a way, there is there is that. Then I like your point about the questions of sympathy and questions of. So in a way, it leads also to the question of changing questions or be remaining flexible with questions, which uh, relates actually very well to. The point I had to to Marianne about the the, the spaces of openings and potentialities. Um, I, I find it very interesting that you began with, uh, you know, questions of ethno art and ethnography, um, and as you encounter the archive view, it is potentiality that you that that drew you, uh, uh, literally from within the sources, from the title of one of the volumes, and also more broadly in methodological terms. My question would be, what, what point of entry would you like to take? Do you have one? Thank uh, you. Like what are, or even what are your struggles uh, in terms of seeking one maybe? All right, it's a huge, <laughs> it's a real question because it's the first time in my life 
where I have such a huge number of objects broadly yeah. understood. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to, to find ways to, of course, I will not be able to, to work on them all because there are thousands. Yeah. So for now, what I'm doing is to try to connect uh, this, the idea, the very idea of this broad collection with today's questions. And somehow that's um, interesting because um, we see that it's not a linear story. Um, and we see how um, questions that Murumi was raising somehow by these very gestures are still very relevant, come back today with yeah. um, especially thinking about the question of restitution, which is very alive today in all over the world and particularly between Europe and Africa. Africa, yeah. Um, and so, yes, I'm trying to think more about, uh, yeah, more I would say the philosophical idea that it's behind the idea of gathering th so many things to, to, and to keep them on site for once and to revert yes, to reverse, um, the flow of things uh, that uh, generally go from Africa to Europe and um, yeah, to reverse the, 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 this gesture. Yeah, yeah. No, because there is a certain kind of uh, materiality, right, to the, to, to the archive itself in terms of the miscellaneousness, uh, what we encounter and, and our own, uh, I guess, emotional, or disciplinary <laughs> struggle with, uh, um, so would you say that then listening in, as it were, uh, staying along the grain of, in this case, Morumbi, uh, could be one way of, you know, a, a kind of flexibility then in yourself as a scholar um, to kind of bend with it and see where it takes you. And I, I say this because often, um, in art history, not so much now, maybe the, the tendency to work with singular artists, which is also a necessity, uh, gives you a certain kind of stability. I'm working on this artist. What, what happens when you work on an archive? I think that is a broader question. How do you find a footing there? Um, I will quickly digress because I, I see that there is a question apparently for me of what I mean by archives of absence. I'll just reflect on that because it's connected. Archives of absence is when the artist is not present in this course, uh, right? So the, the artist uh, herself is not present in the histories. Um, so as a historian, I cannot ask structural, I, I, you know, I cannot ask obvious questions because that participation is not there. So how do we write histories of non-participation or refusal like uh, Toshif at another point has said. So the, the slipping in and out consciously and otherwise, deliberately and otherwise is an interesting one. And, um, and, and, and it is there, I think here also relating to how do we encounter this miscellaneousness is this question of the fragment in the police case, for instance. Uh, and I, I, I have huge sympathies with this, the haunting of a fragment um, and how a singular photograph, huh? not miscellaneousness in this case, but singularity, the singular photograph can keep haunting us and that can, can generate multiple, uh, multiple frames, right? It can, uh, it can have its own frames and, uh, um, and also in Deepthi's case, which is something I myself encountered in another context was, uh, what does an archive look like? Right. It's in fact the diametric opposite of, of Marianne's case uh, when it is the sparseness. Right. Um, so what does an archive look like? And you talk about uh, you talk about uh, going to the periodicals um, uh, for for answers. Uh, and what I, I was. Uh, let me see. Where did I put it? Uh, you know, you had this book that you have. If my Hindi reading is correct, uh, it, uh, that script at least is correct. It is Kala Ek Anubhuti Ek Chintan, right? So in that sense, it is a sensorium and thought, right? So there is, and I was wondering when was this published? Because we look for, we talk about history of ideas, we talk about imaginations, and here it is in the title itself. So the author writing about it is talking about art as a sensorium and art as, uh, as thought, really. Uh, so sometimes maybe a singular, a singular title gives us an entry point into the thought worlds of a person, whether that person is A, visible or not, B, prominent or not, right? So that I found uh, very, um, very interesting uh, as, a, as a, 
uh, thinking about what archives of refusal look like. So, uh, but it does look like to me, Deepthi, this is a bit of a digression, but you have found lots of stuff, haven't you? Um, so the book was published in 1976, uh, just yeah. for the reference. And I think he was, um, so Naren Bahadur Singh was pretty active 60s to let's say like late 70s or early 80s, he yeah. produced a lot of stuff, including this collection of essays, which is like you've suggested, just his, he's just thinking through his thoughts and writing yeah. them about his experiences of meeting an artist somewhere down the road or like, you know, like me looking at an art in a gallery. So it's a collection of essays that is pretty much as you described. Um, but in terms of finding stuff uh, and relating it back to archives, I think it's interesting because this is not something that I was thinking, but somebody else in that I've been talking to was think, um, a, a couple of people who I've been talking to have been thinking about the history of archives is so connected to history of colonialism. And Nepali history of colonialism is very distinct. Mm -hmm. um, there might be shared commensurate experiences and encounters, and I would not deny that at all. <laughs> and But there are also ways in which Nepal somehow was always, um, always had a very specific relations with the British Raj in India. And so that really, I think, affects the way in which archive becomes a subject of study in Nepal. Mm. If, you look at, if you look at the British archives on Nepal, Nepal is almost this medieval nation, uh, sovereign, uh, hidden in the mountains, <laughs> somehow survived progress, right? And as you move towards the national archives, you start encountering a lot of rhetoric and development, a lot yeah. of de de rhetoric and progress. And there are many scholars who've worked on the national archives and who have to actually like sort of always like uh, hop between archives. They have to go to India, they have to travel to London, whatever it is, right? To gather all these resources to even have a semblance of what the National Archive is as a, as a state project, right? And so there's a lot of jumping around archives as well. For me, archives is a very new thing. Mm -hmm. I, I struggle with it genuinely. <laughs> um, dates can be very misguiding. Uh, you look at a publication, you see 1976 and you think that, oh, this was the conversation happening in 1976. But what is to say that the conversation wasn't already happening perhaps in the early 50s or in okay. the 60s and only became somehow consolidated into text at this moment that was a result of many forces, right? And so I, I think for me, archive will always be a point of contention, but not in a non-productive way, but in a very generative way. I think yeah. it will keep me very accountable as well. And so yeah. mixing archival work and ethno ethnographic work really allows me to sort of, I don't know, balance this struggle, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. And this will also reflect I suppose what you also mean by the state sponsored, because it seems that there is a state sponsored intellectual engagement with the archive also. So it would be great if that is also brought into, you, you talked about incommensurability. It's very helpful when one word is a lead to the next thing I wanted to say, uh, in this case to Tashif. Um, yeah, uh, so many things to say. I will just, I guess, stick to how fascinating I find the point about escape. And I think these are thoughts I have not heard in Dhaka uh, so maybe you have thought this through. Uh, so the point about refusal and escape and slipping in and out of frames because the subjects are moving. So the, the loci of thoughts are moving. And so in a way, it's a, it's a radical way of delinking a thought to place, right? So, and it allows for, like you say, uh, you know, the rethinking the universalism and there is so much scholarship on universalism. We counter a Cold War universalism with, uh, you know, Islamic cosmopolitanism, uh, very much with, 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 with what uh, Carlos was also thinking about for, uh, uh, in, in terms of the Malay, um, the worlding uh, universalism that is attuned to the minority, uh, the minority's right to uh, belong or not, and the ocean's uh, materiality, right? So I would, so, the, so the, I find this point about universalism and 
the fluidity of the ocean uh, and the universalism that is not given, but that is, how do I say this, amorphous in the sense, you know, the, the fact that you literally construct your identities in terms of buildings, you, and, uh, ha and, and how, how motion creates particular, and it's a different understanding of motion also, right? It is not just people moving and meeting. It is also displacement. It, it is uh, at, at different levels or personal choices to move. And I think there are multiple possibilities of nuancing that. I could go on endlessly actually, but uh, maybe we could open up the, uh, for questions and uh, yeah, depending on how many questions we have, you can also keep responding more broadly. I think uh, any thoughts you all have on the archive would be great. Um, but also going back to the question of what Mahasa, as I would still call an experimental, a dialogue in, uh, in, in motion, you know, we ourselves have learned a lot since we met in Hong Kong. So you could reflect on that, but we can see if there are questions. Um, John? Yeah, so we so, have one. Oh, yeah, we had one. Oh, and um, I actually did, was curious, um, since, you know, this is something that um, I think Tashif and Dipti brought up. Um, and uh, Marianne alluded to, but I was wondering if you could, um, for the participants, speak a little more about, you know, um, how your research has progressed since, you know, for those of us who didn't talk about that, um, maybe to just hear from Carlos and maybe a little more from Marianne about, you know, um, the projects that, you know, ha have been undertaken since then, or if there are other things that you've, you, you've found uh, notable or striking in relation to your experience at Mahasa. I think I uh, see here that Toshif was trying can I, to can I respond or no. yeah, maybe yeah, Toshif yeah. can say that. Yeah, I, I mean, and then we can go to, I don't know, yeah. unless you, but no, I mean, that's you, I mean, you basically phrased it far better than I did <laughs> because, um, this idea of, of, uh, of escape and, and, and a universalism, basically, I mean, how to critique cosmopolitanism yeah. without, uh, without re reverting to its kind of, you know, old ways and kind of, and, and also reverting to a kind of liberal f idea of demography and the statistical, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. Which, is, which is something that I've been struggling with and I think, you know, speaks to the present um, in many ways, right? And the kind of erosion of, of minorities, either the, the complete acceptance um, and hardening of the minority category or mm -hmm. the destruction of the minority category. And that's, those are kind of two really extreme poles right now that I've, I've been sort of, you know, we, we see in global politics. So, um, and I guess just one thing to talk about the ocean, actually the fluidity is where this idea comes from. And, you know, I have to give some credit to Gandhi because his idea, his idea of, of his sort of ideal vision was a spatialized metaphor, right? It was not the pyramid, which he sort of says, this is not what we want. We don't want a hierarchical pyramid. He calls it the oceanic circle where each, individual fragment dissolves into the wider whole. And of course, so there's violence there as well, right? Where you kind of are required to sacrifice individuality in order to escape into this broader yeah. whole. But um, it is from fluidity that that idea is generated, right? And portability. Um, one, of the, one of the spaces that is uh, disavowed by the Khojas is the dukkha, right? The shop, <laughs> That's um, very right? And which is a portable space. It's by definition, you know, corrugated iron, you know, like collapsible. Um, it's disavowed in favor of concrete and industry, but it's also um, signifies kind of impermanence, um, which is against the kind of um, fixity of what they want to say. Um, so I guess that's kind of all I'll um, maybe say on that. And then to talk about maybe progression of research. I mean, I'd love to hear from everybody else, but I think Masa kind of, it needs to sort of simmer and mature in the background. And then you look back and like, wow, that was really intense. <laughs> um, so I think just, uh, yeah, also kind of post COVID thinking about, we, we were kind of critiquing connection a lot at Mahasa towards the end and, 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 and thinking a lot about rupture. And then immediately after Dhaka, we have this is massive rupture that we're, they're all living through. And so thinking really how productive rupture can actually be for, for, not only for intellectual life, but for culture um, and, 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 you know, research, but just broadly, globally, right? Like this is, yeah. this is a kind of generative moment as much as it is um, destructive. So I guess yeah. I'll leave it at that, but yeah. 
yeah, lots to think, lots to think about. So John's uh, John's open-ended question then about uh, was it? Yeah, you all can take take that. Was it? Um, who did you ask it to specifically? Oh, uh, well, uh, yeah. So maybe Carlos, if you want Carlos, to say a yeah, little more, yeah. yeah. Like yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I think um, in terms of um, like continuing the research, I guess what Mahasa gave us, at, um, especially the participants, are um, connections and um, possible collaborators. That's one. And also um, it allowed um, us to look at things in a very prolific manner. Um, cause it's the idea of, it's a, a big space to work with Mahasa in and across regions. Um, and I think, um, that was the generative moment for me, like, um, looking at, um, what I already know, for example, about the region, um, and refracting it in relation to these, um, ideas that I've never thought of before. Um, in terms of continuing the research, um, Kathleen Ditzig and I um, are actually co-curating a series of programs, which is um, which stems from the ideas that Mahasa has given us. Um, um, it's about uh, the, the affinities between Africa and Southeast Asia, um, and I think what I learned from Mahasa is that there isn't necessarily the grammar to talk about these things, mm. um, but you have to create the grammar, the generative grammars from which to um, think about things that are not necessarily foregrounded, especially in our colonial, neo-colonial entanglements and our relations to knowledge and um, how limited it is to, for us, especially if we think about the archive, for one. Um, mm. It's sometimes difficult to establish, find, or constitute an archive that would be helpful for us. It's, it's, it's also part of scholarship um, for me, especially. It's also part of scholarship to, to constitute this archive from which um, idioms might be um, allowed to proliferate and um, thrive. Very much so. We have a question here, I'll jump in because it's connected to what Carlos is saying. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee to everyone. Uh, what are your views about developing a modern BNL archive? Um, uh, things to take into account uh, uh, for that, I guess. And the second question is, what is the significance of the year 1989 in art biennial history? Uh, something you all could all in your responses uh, think about if it, if it is, uh, um, uh, I could uh, just uh, just to reflect on uh, Carlos's point a bit about you and Kathleen working together. I learned a lot. I, I teach one of uh, Kathleen's uh, articles this time in my uh, art and decolonization class, and the students really enjoyed that kind of embeddedness in the archive and asking questions from there. I think that's very helpful. Um, Carlos, if you want to very quickly reflect on this point, otherwise others can also jump in. Huh? So. Yeah, um, maybe maybe others. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Others. Um, I think the point about Mahasa and Mahasa I, as a methodology, as a space, as a struggle. All of you can uh, jump in. Can I? Can I? Maybe. Um, I think, and this maybe touches on some of the uh, the points that you and Carlos have made, which is, I think, you know, thinking about um, the to the the question about you know what is uh, what would be in a modern biennials archive i think one of the things that you know we can hear in all what you know um, is maybe a through line in the different presentations is that you know the idea of a modern biennials archive in itself is something that is not obvious right I mean, I think that I'm not saying that there are biennials in the modern period that, you know, are just waiting to be discovered. But but I think, you know, just extrapolating from Mar what Marianne was saying, what Dipti was saying is it's not necessarily clear what the points of an exhibition history to kind of expand maybe from a biennial, you know, to think about this in terms of exhibition history where art is encountering a public. Those moments are not obvious and clear, right? Th that history is not necessarily um, uh, 
um, even if it's been written written in the past, is not necessarily at a point where it's readily accessible to people. I mean, Dipti, I think, made this point very, very um, um, uh, clearly, I think, you know, in pointing to the existence of a volume that actually is a writing, but yet somehow kind of is occluded, you know, like from from certain memories or a certain kind of consciousness, right? And I think Marianne makes that point in thinking about Joseph Marumbi's archive in the way that, you know, it kind of is there, but it's not necessarily active or active. It yeah. needs to be activated, right? So I think, you know, the idea of a modern biennials archive is something you need to like actually trace that, those points before you can even start thinking about what that archive is. So it's kind of like this um, dialectical relationship almost, right? Um, that would be one way of thinking about it. Um, I don't know if other people have any, yeah, I think. Yeah, and also these are in such disparate kind of places, uh, you know, even if I just look at the non quote unquote Western biennials in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the 20th century, there are collections, you know, our colleagues in Latin America, colleagues working in the Arab context, uh, um, they talk about these disparate places, but like John said, are these necessarily activated spaces, uh, these archives? And if so, what are the questions we are asking of them? Um, I think connected histories of biennials is a fascinating topic, but I think it's, an, it's a collaborative one. I do not know if bringing it in one place is going to address it. Mm -hmm. um, another, I think another uh, project on these connected histories with knowledge of vernacular uh, different languages would be very important. And histories, those particular histories, because the biennial, I think, is also a space where multiple histories converge, not necessarily commensurate, but uh, converge in a, in, a, in a literal sense. So um, it's an interesting question to think about. Um, uh, we'll take another question here, because we have Kevin, Ch Kevin Chua's questions. Kevin's question is to Carlos. Could you speak a bit more about the word belatedness? A lot of rhetoric of modernity in the region in the 1990s was over nation building and national development, but which we can think of, which we can think of as a forward looking in a certain way. Belatedness in this light is thought of as something negative to come after, that is to look backward. Are you trying to recast belatedness as something positive, even strategic for actors, in particular the makers of these <coughs> in the region and in the 1990s. That's an oh, article. Thank, <laughs> uh, <Kevin. laughs> thank, thank you, Kevin, for the question. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, I'm, I'm inspired by um, Mickey Ball's um, theorization on the idea of being preposterous and this idea of the latentness cast in this light, um, I think, is one way to configure discourse around the 1990s. Because it's easy, it's easy and simple enough to um, brand the history of the 1990s as something anachronistic, for example. That's another word that's brandished about, about the 1990s. Um, it's easy and simple enough to do that. But in terms of um, articulating or parsing how agencies have developed in the 1990s, particularly of this host of um, this generation of art historians who um, has been in informative in the development of art in the region, historiography, art historiography in the region. I think that's, that's a more necessary and hence more difficult thing to do. And for example, in, 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 in the sense that I use belatedness, I want it to be, I want my, my argument to be burdened by this idea of um, being late, but also be propelled by it. Like um, in terms of being late, how does the imagination of modernism change? How does the imagination of, uh, like, how does the um, discourses around nation building inflect this idea of modernism that is not present um, in earlier iterations? In, in for example, in um, Masahiro Osirishoji's um, accounts. So definitely, yes, it's it's a it's a. I, I think of it as a simultaneously burdensome, troublesome, and also um, agentive and interventive way of in, um, questioning the idea of modernism in the 90s. And thank you for the question again. Yeah, I think uh, 
I think Deepthi, uh, Marianne, y'all can jump in at uh, any point. I'm thinking, going back to uh, John's point about uh, Mahasa as a methodological uh, site, you know, in thinking about how your own, what you began with, let's say, in terms of projects, thinking about what you presented, let's say, in Hong Kong, uh, via Dhaka and now, what, what you feel about it? What are the transformations, methodological, if any? Um, yeah, others, anybody? Maybe Deepthi can. I can go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, before I go into that, I, I actually really do think that like what Carlos was talking about uh, using belatedness as as um, a generative category, I, I haven't explicitly mentioned it, but I I like listening to you share your presentations during both Mahasa workshops and even now is it's so central to what I am grappling with as well in the context of Nepali art world, um, the notion of belatedness of of being late or in some cases not even being there um, has been has really ailed the way we like think about or just uh, think about or write about Nepali art scene. And so I just want to acknowledge that I, I find like what you've shared throughout <laughs> a very, very useful for my own research. Um, in terms of what I have been thinking for my own, um, so, and post COVID perhaps is a good way to bring it in is like, I, I just recently, completed my exam. So I, I haven't yet had the opportunity to go to my field. And so I've been waiting for almost a year to go back and do my field work, uh, which is interesting because while I am not in my field, I still maintain contacts with people. And they've been like, WhatsApp has, WhatsApp has become my methods. <laughs> like, everything that I get is via WhatsApp. Like somebody is sending me an image, somebody is sending me a link via this. So it's really funny that I've still managed to somehow remain connected and sort of do my field work in a, remotely as much as it's possible. But I sort of anticipate wanting to further look at state-sponsored institutions. And I think the question of the state, what is at stake in sort of this state and artists sort of encountering each other through these projects has become quite central to my research work. So that's where I would end. Uh, Marianne. <laughs> I think Marianne, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just very quickly. I just yeah. wanted to have one say more question that, to pick up. Yeah. Uh, that um, yeah, it's very difficult to somehow to resume all the different things and ways in which Mahasa has been very powerful and um, a tool for opening new questions or seeing them in a different way. I think that what what I might say now is that it has also been interesting in the way of thinking what doesn't work in mm. the connections that we so try to, to, to do. So, and that, and to think about those non-connection or yeah, something that doesn't work together as a site of productive, yeah, as something productive that we shouldn't try to avoid or that, yeah, that's part of the research and that it might, might lead some, somewhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will stop it here. <laughs> there, is a, there is a question here which might echo some of these points you're saying is what exactly is an activated archive? Does anybody want to pick this up? My, my uh, idea would be oh. that, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so I think I may be tripped that booby trap uh, wire um, by bringing up the idea of that. I guess by activate, when I was talking about archives being activated, I, I meant uh, archives that, you know, are in circulation, the knowledge of which is, can be used and kind of is, ac is access is accessible and is discover discoverable, right? Um, but this actually leads to, to I think, something, I, I wanted to respond to something that Dipti was saying um, that I think helped me tie together some of what all of you have been saying, which is the, the kind of the question of belatedness or absence and how, 
Um, and maybe, you know, this is also riffs off something that Tauschiff was pointing out, which is that rupture can be a kind of generative and not just a merely a destructive kind of force, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the fact of not being there, whether in terms of time or in terms of space, it also actually offers a certain kind of distance. So, you know, uh, what I was saying earlier about the history of modernism being written, needing to be written before you can constitute an archive of it, right? In some ways, um, I think, you know, what Carlos's presentation is demonstrating is like that history is not necessarily, um, it's the accessible versions of it anyway for us are precisely the ones that are written after the fact in some ways, right? Th that are being written by us rather than necessarily given to us. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting point. Um, I, there was a question actually though um, I, that I just wanna make sure we don't skip out that was specifically for Tauschiff. Yeah. Uh, which has to do with um, following Tauschiff's theorization of the Indian Ocean as a zone of refusal. Can he expand on this circulation of the modern through maritime routes? That's a, that's a good one. Um, I guess I, I, maybe I'll try into belatedness and absence, perhaps. Um, and maybe contemporary, because these routes are not, I mean, the idea that kind of pulses throughout the moment of decolonization is these roots kind of die off after the British and after, you know, but, but of course they're, they're alive and well, they just take on different forms. Um, for instance, um, migrants who leave Zanzibar today to go to the Gulf to work uh, as temporary workers um, are called in Swahili Ugaibu, uh, which, which translates as absent, but, but with the idea of return embedded in. So they're already tied into this, this question of time, right, and presence. Um, and so, you know, even if we think through the Indian Ocean as a site, um, it speaks already to the sense of how kind of prolepsis is embedded into these ideas of, dis uh, of kind of, um, you know, circulation. Um, and of course, waiting, which is a kind of mirror of belatedness, right? Either if you're late, you're also waiting to catch up, right? Um, which is which is a charge mounted against you know the colonized world since you know <laughs> you know since the kind of encounter. Um, but waiting itself is is a kind of generative space because it allows one to kind of transcend, like this space of the minority of the space of absence, um, waiting is something that can be refused and something that's actually, I mean, it operates in a particular idea of tempor temporality. Um, so I would say like, you know, this the idea of the waiting room of history, which is of course, you know, Chakravarti's term is, is it's a spatial metaphor, right? Which I think is really interesting. Um, and, and how to actually reject that um, is, is something, you know, interesting. And, and just that these maritime routes are, they're not dead um, and that they operate and they actually tell us a lot about the Indian Ocean and its longer, longer history. I think waiting is a great place to kind of close this yeah. December of 2020, but John. Uh, yes, definitely waiting room of history is, a, is seems like a, that's a very kind of um, apt phrase. Um, I, I, and we do indeed have to close, but I do want to kind of um, give one last uh, minute to Mariam because I think you had wanted to bring up a project that you had wanted to, you, that you are working on, the inventories project. And I was wondering if you could just say a word about that before we conclude. Yes, sure, thank you. Um, so it's a kind of a ways, uh, way of working on what Murumbi did today, <laughs> somehow, <laughs> it's a joint project. And uh, what we do, we are different colleagues uh, working mainly in Germany and in Kenya. Uh, we are yeah, a group of museum professionals, researchers, artists, and we are creating ourselves uh, an archive somehow, which is an archive of objects, Kenyan objects, which have been, which are held today in Western institutions. Mm. And um, and so far we are very happy because we, after two years of work, we have put together uh, an inventory of more than thirty thousand objects uh -huh. which lie outside Kenya. Mm. And uh, yeah, just yeah, just. And to how say do that, we find out more? How do we how do we access it? Yeah, we have a website <laughs> which is in the International Inventories Program, and I just wanted to say that we will have an exhibition next year, and somehow for 
one of the projects which lies inside of this inventory has been in touch with uh, the shift. He will be on board with us working on a commentary of one object and also with uh, um, Sneha and Nupur at AAA in India because it's yeah. an imperial history that we are working together. So Mahasa somehow works also in these small connections uh, that we have built uh, over time. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so from the waiting room of history to the international inventories program. Um, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you all uh, for this wonderful uh, hour and a half actually. Um, um, and it's been great seeing all of you and um, hearing uh, what about your thoughts and also what you've been up to. And thank you, uh, so thank you to the presenters, uh, Carlos, Marianne, Tavshif, and Dipti, and thank you Sanjukta uh, for moderating so gracefully. And um, thank you to the audience uh, for joining us and um, uh, stay tuned for more. And, um, and I guess I, with that, I'll just say good morning to Dipti and, <laughs> good, morning. and good afternoon and good night. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.